tangi a te manu. Tui, 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 tui a. Tui e runga, tui e raro. Tui e waho, tui e roto. Tui e i te muka tangata. I tākia mai. I Hawaii ki nui, Hawaii ki roa, Hawaii ki pā mamao. Ti hono ki wai roa. Ki te whai au, ki te o mārama. Ti hei Māori ora. Kā maharati a te hunga ko wehi atu, hairi koto, hairi koto. Hairi ki te tonu i tanga o te rā, e korirau a koto, e wariware tia. Hairi koto, hairi koto. Te rangi e tu nei, tēnā koe, tēnā koe. Te whara nui e tu nei, tēnā koe, tēnā koe. Te marae a tia ki te koto nei, tēnā koe, tēnā koe. Ki e koto... Nā mana hiri tūrangi, hairi mai, hairi mai. E whaka eki nei ki te whaka honore e tēnei pō. Ki a koe, te rangatira. Hairi mai, hairi mai. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. A song. Te aroha, te whakamono, me te rangi māori e Te motu rauranga, tēra mā, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou. Welcome to all of you, and it's just wonderful to see the turnout we have here, and I think that's probably a great tribute to, first of all, the people who spoke last week, Hannah, who's here somewhere, and to her and Margie. Uh, for the, the platform they set, and also to Bishop John Black, um, who is renowned um, for his um, eloquence um, and he is going to be speaking to us in a moment. Uh, so welcome to you all. It's great to see you um, to talk and discuss and be informed about this most important topic. And I, I, I say be informed because there hasn't been a lot of informing done um, over the last wee while about it. Um, I think the thing is, is swathed in ignorance myself. Um, so hopefully we can shed some light on this tonight for you, um, as we did last week. So at this point I'm going to hand over to... Kia ora John and... In stark contrast to our speaker, uh, Bishop John, uh, I am someone who is not renowned for my eloquence or my intellect, um, <clears throat> but my name is Richard Lamb, so I could call Richard Lamb Tokawinga, and I will be your I will be your MC for this evening. Um, <clears throat> I think it's appropriate to open the space tonight with a karakia. Um, a karakia can possibly be interpreted as a prayer, and perhaps in this space it could be seen as such, but it's not always just as simple as that. So a karakia is about intention, it's about setting goodwill, and it's about setting a good direction. So tirohi a kito maunga, turn to that landmark from which you draw strength as we start with karakia. E arara, e arara, e arara e te kōrero, e arara e te wānanga, e arara e te whakaro nui, 
e arara e tanako whakaiti, tūturu whakamaua ki a tina, tina, haumi e hui e, tai ki e. Kia ora koutou. So loosely translated, that karakia, I think, is appropriate for tonight. It says, arise, arise, may discussion occur, may deliberation take place, may thoughtfulness be present, may humility come to the fore, and all these things shall come to pass be because we are all agreed in unison. <clears throat> Tuhi ki te rangi, tuhi ki te whenua, tuhi ki te nāko o ngā tangata. Ko tēmea nui, ko ngā tangata o ngā hoe whā. E te whare, hāhi e tūnei, tēnā koe. Mō i manā ki korawai ki a tātou. So I've just acknowledged the space, the sacred space in which we are in, and the korawai, the cloak of manā ki or care or support that it provides to us all. E ngā tangata o ngā hoe whā, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Greetings to you all, each and every one of you. Nau mai haere mai ki tēne wānanga i whakamana ai e te amorangi a pīhopa Jim White. And welcome to this talk in memory of Bishop Jim White, a strong advocate for social justice and those who are marginalised in our society. Nei rā te mihi ki a koea, John Bluck, e te manakura, e pupuhi ana nā hoa mihi ki a koe. And greetings to our honoured guest for this evening, Bishop John Bluck. Kei te tika te korero i o tātou tūpuna. Waiho i te toipoto, kaua i te toiroa. So we want to start our gathering today with a whakatoki, and we are acknowledging the correctness of the, I guess, the sayings of our ancestors. So that particular whakatoki, again, is quite appropriate, I think. It's, let us keep close together, not far apart. Nō reira, ngā mihi nui ki a koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. <clears throat> so I wanted to acknowledge some people who are here, especially um, Bishop Jim's wife, Jane, who was going to be here, but unfortunately she's had to put in her apologies. She's got a conflict, so can't be with us tonight. Um, I see Hannah is at the back, and I'm not sure whether Margie's on her way. Hopefully she is. But Hannah and Margie, who were our speakers from last week, a special warm welcome to St Andrews. It's lovely to have you here with us tonight. And Chris and Claire Farrelly, who are also here, and Chris was our speaker at St Andrews last year. Um, for this particular lecture. So welcome to you, Chris and Claire. It's lovely to have you with us tonight. Uh, we just have to deal with some admin administrivia before we start. Um, health and safety, as always, in the event of some emergency where we need to suddenly evacuate the building, it's very simple. You go out the way you came in. Um, unlike All Saints last, uh, last week, there is no danger of organ pipes falling on you as you leave out the back, so you are perfectly safe to do that. Um, if you need to go to the toilets, I would suggest that you hold on, but in <laughs> <coughs> if it really becomes a, another form of emergency, uh, the toilets are at the back of the church and good luck trying to get there. You need to go outside and go that way where it's well lit and dodge the scaffolding or go that way where it's not very well lit and dodge the gravestones. You choose. <laughs> but the toilets are basically directly behind the building. Um, <clears throat> once you get there, it's well lit and they're very nice. Um, <clears throat> so how this evening is going to proceed, I am going to shortly introduce our guest speaker, Bishop John, um, and he will then deliver his address and we then have an opportunity for a more interactive time where there will be questions and answers. Um, and we will explain how that's going to proceed when we get to that point in the, in the proceedings. Um, after the formal part of the evening is finished, we warmly invite you, if you have time and would like to do so, to stay for refreshments that will be served at the back of the church where you can perhaps chat a little bit more, more informally with each other or perhaps with Bishop John over a cup of tea. And I just want to acknowledge, as always, the hard work of Di Kenderdine at the back of the church there, who is our caterer extraordinaire here at St Andrews. Thank you, Di, for everything that you do. 
So Bishop John Bluck is a writer and a broadcaster with a lifetime of working on bicultural issues. He has a number of earlier books, most of which are centred around life here in Aotearoa and looking at different aspects of that. Um, but not only is he a wordsmith in the written word, he is also a very skilled communicator in the spoken word as well. And those of you that might, like myself, enjoy podcasts at national radio would be familiar with some of John's work there on topics as varied as the road network in Aotearoa through to the joys of mowing lawns. Um, <clears throat> he has also influenced many people with his spoken words in his work within the Anglican Church. So he is a retired Anglican bishop, a former dean of Christchurch Cathedral before it fell down in the earthquake, and he has worked ecumenically all around New Zealand and overseas, including serving as the communication director for the World Council of Churches based in Geneva. Um, John's latest book, Becoming Pākehā, A Journey Between Two Cultures, uh, offers a deep and introspective look at the formation of Pākehā identity in New Zealand and the ongoing dialogue between Pākehā and Māori cultures. It's part memoir, part essay, and John uses his own life story and experience to illustrate his efforts to discern what it means to belong in this land as a Pākehā. I should just say as a quick aside that I thought, I know what I'll do, I'll stick a question to ChatGPT um, and just say, give me a summary of John Black's life and just see what it says. Um, it assured me that he died in 2014. <laughs> so I have to say, John, you're looking remarkably good on it. And I decided that I better do my own research. Um, but moving on, if we are going to be able to build something better together, these two cultures of ours, then a trusting, mutually respectful relationship has got to be at the core of that. And I think John would suggest that we are far from there at present. And that is why it was such a breath of fresh air. It was so hopeful and so optimistic to hear from Margie Tukarangi and Hannah Andrews, the co-chairs from the Newton Central School Board of Trustees last week. They shared their story of effective co-governance with a 25-year pedigree in that place. And what many took away from that was not only their words, but their actions as well. So when I say their actions, not only the actions that they have brought about at the school, but how Hannah and Margie interacted with each other as they presented to us. They represented co-governance in thought and word and in action. And if that's what co-governance looks like, then all I can say is bring it on. I've been looking forward to hearing, hearing John's Fakaro ever since he agreed to speak to us this year, and so without any further delay, I will invite him to do just that. So please give a warm welcome to Bishop John Black. Tana was a writing, no my hurry my. I'm privileged to be here in this place of worship, this Fari Karakia. I have many happy memories of being part of the life of this community for a short time. And I'm conscious that what I have to say is only possible by the examples and the support of people who have gone before me. Some of them people who went before me from this place. I think of Warren Limbrick who was once part of this place and was the man who encouraged me to go and study theology in America rather than England, which was the fashionable thing to do at the time. 
And it was that experience uh, of being in America at the time of the civil rights movement uh, and walking past the statue of a young student who only two years before my arrival had been murdered in Alabama on a civil rights march. And I, for the first time, encountered what the face of racism really looked like. And that awakening was something that I brought home with me and has shaped my life ever since. And I think of Dave Lawrence, who is lying in your memorial garden, who supported me in my time at Christchurch Cathedral, where we introduced bicultural worship and liturgy for the first time, much to the dismay and confusion of my Cantabrian colleagues. And I think of Bruce Davidson, who used to serve for me at the 8 o'clock service here, a man who was pivotal in forming the bicultural story of this church and who was active and involved in the work of building the new constitution for our church and for building the Hikoi of Hope the 25th anniversary of which we celebrate next month. So those are just a few of the people that are standing behind me and around me as I tried to put some words together for this evening. This lecture series is like the man that we honor tonight. Jim White was always a step ahead of most of us hoping, dreaming. And the lecture title is about a dream. It assumes co-governance is our future, something that needs to happen. But it's also a present reality. It's already happening in some places. And last week we heard from Magi Tokorangi and Hannah Andrews, two co-chairs of the board of Newton Central School, and they described that 25-year journey that has transformed the school in the way that decisions are made, in the way that children relate to each other, in the way that two world views are held together in a bond of whanauatanga. And it's a journey that holds the clues to what all schools in Aotearoa could look like one day, what the country could look like one day. We've come too far not to go further, they told us last week. And anyone who heard their passion for this co-governance journey would have to feel hopeful about the future. But sadly, that confidence is not shared by everyone. And we will just see how many share it in the forthcoming election. The opponents of co-governance believe it was a mistake to let it happen, to let it begin, and it should be stopped. Bang, crash, smash. Welcome to the space between these opposing forces. And don't be fooled by those who say it's not a dangerous space to be in. Our leaders reassured us on Tuesday night that they all believed in co-governance. But it wasn't the sort of co-governance that Newton School is practicing. We've been living in this dangerous space for a while now. Ranganui Walker used to say, the Crown has been acting for the last 180 years as if they had taken over charge of the country. And the Maori chiefs have been acting as if they never let it go. 
collision territory, sometimes hidden, sometimes quiet, but never noisier or more damaging than it is now. So what's it like to live in this in-between space? Well, I can't speak for Maori. I can only watch and listen. But for Pākehā, it is a scary place. I've spent the last year travelling around the country talking to audiences about my book, Becoming Pākehā. And the subtitle I've given is A Journey Between Two Cultures. And I wrote that a year ago. I'd call it a crash course now. So why all this fear and unease? A Maori woman with a full moko kawe sat in the front row of my audience in Christchurch. And she listened intently to my speech. She didn't say a word through the Q&A that followed. She waited till everyone had left, and then she came up to me and said, I've only got one question. What are Pākehā so afraid of? And I fumbled for an answer, and I eventually managed to say, well, maybe it's because we have been sitting in the front seat of the bus for so long, we think we're entitled to it. And now it looks like we might have to move back a few rows. As the treaty becomes front and central in the national debate, as place names change overnight, as Te Reo intertwines with English on radio and TV and in classrooms around the country, as Eden Park crowds swing poi and brown faces outnumber white in sporting teams, even the slowest learners in the whitest and leafiest suburbs sense something's going down that wasn't there before something scary. Julian Batchelor has helpfully produced and popped into our letterboxes a pamphlet on co-governance that summarizes just what these fears are. On page one it says, suddenly we are discovering Maori influence in almost every aspect of our lives from signs in supermarkets, changes in street names, schools and hospitals. What on earth is going on? There's a website listed in the pamphlet, but no names of any political parties, though several would love to support the call to abandon all co-governance, scrap the Waitangi Tribunal, the Treaty of Waitangi Act, and all the laws that flow from it. Pull the plug on all of this, this Maorification, as it's called, which leads to co-governance. Vote for the party which is going to abandon it, says the pamphlet in bold type. Completely abandon, not partly abandon it. W. H. Auden wrote a poem about grieving a sudden death that demands an instant response. Stop the clocks, pull out the telephone, prevent the dog from barking with a bone. The fears around co-governance trigger the same urgency and alarm. So what is happening here? 25 years ago, some of us were involved in drafting and promoting a new constitution for the Anglican Church in Aotearoa. 
We talked about it for 10 years. We passed the legislation. Then we went around the country talking about co-governance and constitutional reform for the nation, leading up to the Hikoi of Hope in 1998, when the Prime Minister of the day, Jenny Shipley, was presented with a call to end poverty and introduce co-governance. She was not amused. But I don't remember any of that debate triggering fear and loathing on the scale that we see today. So what is going on? Well, part of the answer lies in the toxic times that we are living through globally. Culture wars, politics that divide us by identity and race, white supremacist campaigns, conspiracy theories about international cabals, secret technologies, vaccinations that control our lives, all driven on social media that lets us demean each other from the anonymous safety of cyberspace. But much more of the answer lies in the way we have ignored and rewritten our own history as a bicultural nation so successfully that some Pākehā people are genuinely bewildered by where all this Māori stuff is coming from. Now you might wonder where they've been for the last 180 years, but, <laughs> but their bewilderment and their fear is real and authentic. To downplay it or deny it is simply to widen the gap in understanding. What's needed is a respectful, careful program of getting inside the history that we share as New Zealanders and the commitments we made to each other as Pākehā and Māori that let us live alongside each other with dignity as Newton School shows us how to do. And once we've begun to do that, the fear and the loathing that words like co-governance seem to trigger will start to fade. So where does this history that we share begin? Well, Māori trace their separate story back a thousand years and more sailing from here from the far corners of the Pacific. And Pākehā trace their story from Western Europe mostly, British primarily, but today more and more Asian and Indian. Now, you can hang on to those separate stories, those backstories as Pākehā have when they called themselves Britons, better Britons, even after a generation or two of living here, and talked like my grandparents talked about going home to England. Well, that fashion quickly withered when Britain joined the European Common Market in 1973 and turned up its nose at our mutton and cheese. So a more workable story is needed <coughs> and a war workable name. If you don't want to hang your hat in your future on calling yourself a better Briton and pretending that you're living on some offshore island of the homeland. So let's start by taking the name that Māori give us to describe our partnership, Pākehā. And here is the first of two astonishing facts from the leaders' debate last Tuesday. The word Pākehā was never mentioned, not once. So who are we if we are not Māori? Well, said the leaders, we are non-Māori. 
We describe ourselves by who we're not. Think about that as a name. Good evening. This is not John Bluck speaking to you. <laughs> so we start with a name, and then we start with a treaty. It's a pretty unique kind of treaty in the context of the colonial empires of early 19th century. The motives that drove it are a complex mix, fear of French getting a foothold as they had in Akaroa, fear of unruly sailors and Aussie convicts, Maori worries about being overwhelmed, immigration schemes like the New Zealand company's hunger for land, missionaries wanting to protect their work, a liberal English respect for the rights of indigenous people, and the plain old greed of growing an empire by right of discovery. The document signed in 1840 by the Crown and 500 chiefs was the nearest thing that was possible in a country that had no central lawmaking authority. And it purported to give both Maori and the newly arrived Pākehā the security they needed and to ensure that land sales were fair and properly done. The chiefs who signed it didn't for a moment think they were giving away their authority over their 80,000 strong people and the handful of British, some 2,000 at the most, military, officials, missionaries, teachers, sealers, whalers, didn't imagine for a moment that they were suddenly in control. To be clear about that, we have to consider all the versions of the treaty. Though the Maori text is the definitive one in international law. But the treaty is much more than a legal document. Last week, Hannah talked about the two texts, but James Belich, the historian, argues there are at least five versions of the treaty. An English one that gives sovereignty to Britain but doesn't mention chieftainship, Rangantiratanga. A Maori version that gives governance, kawanatanga, to the crown, but retains rangatiratanga to Māori, and just to be sure, adds titino rangatiratanga, absolute authority. And then there are three more versions that are about the spirit rather than the letter of the law. What is most important for our co-governance discussion is the spirit of this document, the intention of those who signed it. Less than 15% of the chiefs could have been able to read it or sign it with more than a mark. What they assented to was worked out by a series of oral agreements among them. Korero up and down the country long into the night at Waitangi and beyond, as the signatures were slowly gathered. And through that long oral process, a covenant of trust was hammered out, strong enough to allow thousands of Maoris to sell land and welcome settlers almost immediately, providing food to new arrivals who would otherwise have starved much more than a legal document, the treaty was an act of mutual consent. Following the orders of the Foreign Office that said it had to be, to quote, an amiable negotiation with the free concurrence of the chiefs. And 150 years later, Justice Robin Cook in the Court of Appeal in Wellington ruled that the treaty was a mutual compact of obligation, 
akin to a partnership. And that's not just a legal ruling, it's a pithy summary of the spirit and the intent of the treaty. It's the heart and soul of what co-governance is about. And here's the second astonishing fact from the leaders' debate on Tuesday. The Treaty of Waitangi, let alone Te Tariti o Waitangi, was never mentioned. A passing reference to treaty settlements, but not a whiff of the treaty. Can you imagine an election campaign in the US never mentioning their constitution? Now, a cynic would say, don't be surprised. There's a long road between Waitangi and Wellington, between 1840 and 1987 and 2023. A long road still paved with broken promises. And just a few examples, and you don't have to be a cynic to be shocked by them. Te Tariti o Waitangi guaranteed protection of all things Māori to remain in Māori control. Ensuring, for example, that Māori land could not be bought outside the protection of the Crown. But within four years of the treaty being signed, that safeguard was dismissed by Governor Fitzroy on payment of 10 shillings per sale. And within one year, that payment was reduced to one penny per sale. In 1846, all Maori land not occupied was deemed to be Crown property. By 1852, all male citizens were granted voting rights, provided they held land by individual title. But Māori held theirs by corporate or shared title, so it didn't qualify. And by 1863, all land held by Māori deemed to be in rebellion was confiscated. By 1877, the treaty itself was deemed by Justice Prendergast to be a legal nullity. It took a hundred years for that founding document to be restored, as it has been, by embedding it in law, the treaty, the Waitangi Tribunal, the treaty settlements, school curriculums, placing it at centre stage in Te Papa, even daring to imagine what the treaty might look like and what the country might look like when the treaty is celebrated in 2040 on its 200th birthday. That daring dreaming took the form of a document called He Pua Pua, and we are waiting to see if any political party will dare to pick it up again before the election. We will continue to debate what te tariti means legally, but we can't avoid, however hard we try, to see that it means symbolically, culturally, spiritually, a promise of partnership. And Māori had no doubt about that from the very beginning. It was a covenant, they said a new covenant like the one that Jesus made with his disciples at the Last Supper. That's how Honeheke and Erererua Maihi Patuoni, Papahia, Tamati Wakanene, and other Christian chiefs who signed the treaty described it, along with the missionaries who translated it. And even when the treaty began to be dishonored, those chiefs continued to defend it as a spiritual commitment. Māori never forgot that it was a partnership. Wiramu Tamihana promoted the Kingitanga movement 
to ensure we didn't forget that partnership. Queen Victoria was reminded over and over of her promises, as were her successes. Most recently, the late Queen Elizabeth at Waitangi in 1990 by Archbishop Whakahui Hui Virko. And there's a whole lineage of Maori prophets dating back to Te Koti Rikorangi Te Tutuki, then Rua Kanana, and Tahu Potaki Wiramu Ratana, who made the treaty partnership central to their spiritual message and kept reminding the Crown. Maori never forgot the treaty. And when the breaches of the covenant became intolerable, following the confiscations and the legal skullduggery over land after the New Zealand wars, delegation after delegation set off to London at great expense to protest directly and personally to the Crown. London lawyers were hired to broker the meetings with Queen Victoria, and then with King Edward, then with George V. Hirani Taifanga went to London for Napui in 1882. King Tafio went for the Kingitanga in 1884. King Mahutu went in 1907. King Tarata went in 1914. And finally, T.W. Ratana in 1924. All of them were denied an audience. The personal insult caused to the partnership, especially the Kingitanga, the insult to the covenant was incalculable. It's a pity Phil Goff didn't know that before he insulted King Tuhatia earlier this year on his visit to King Charles' coronation. It was the prophet Ratana who defended the treaty most passionately of all. He based all his teaching on the Bible and the treaty. And having failed to confront the English king, he took on the New Zealand Prime Minister, Michael Savage, in a memorable meeting in 1936, where he presented Savage with a series of symbols to dramatize how the treaty partnership had been betrayed. Huia feathers and greenstone to speak of the Maori heritage being destroyed, and a broken gold watch that Ratana couldn't afford to get fixed, a symbol of broken promises. And it was a spiritual exchange between these two men that went beyond words, and Michael Savage responded accordingly. I take it on myself to remedy these wrongs and injustices he replied, in a manner as near as possible to that required by the Treaty of Waitangi. Neglected though that treaty was at the time, Savage knew about its importance. I tell you, Mr. Ratana, he said, if I am able to remedy the ills you suffer, my soul will not have fear when I finally face God, my maker. Did you hear Margie Tokorangi last week acknowledge what it was that inspired her journey to co-governance at Newton School? It was the legacy of T.W. Ratana, a legacy carried by her family ensuring that the treaty is never forgotten, supported as it was in its spirit. By 1932, just 100 years after the treaty was signed, a petition signed by 38,000 Maori, over two thirds of the population at the time, with that, treat, with that petition, the Ratana movement succeeded finally 
in getting the document tabled in Parliament. It took another 14 years before a select committee was willing to pick it up. But it had finally arrived at the seat of the lawmakers. And to honor that, the land at Waitangi, where the treaty was signed, was gifted to the nation. The treaty that Maori never forgot. Now, all of this is crucial for us today because what Te Tariti evokes symbolically is much more than what it defines legally as the founding document for the nation, our Magna Carta. Chief Judge Joe Williams put it like this to the Constitutional Conference in 2000. There are certain truths which we as New Zealanders hold to be self-evident, he said, and about which there is a critical mass of agreement. These are truths about this country's making and race relations. Or in other, perhaps better words, the treaty was there at the beginning. It promised Maori a fair go. Maori did not get a fair go, and they should. Moana Jackson distills the treaty into six principles around the value of place, tikanga, community, belonging, balance, and conciliation. Every one of them about relationships, partnerships, strategies like co-governance are putting those principles into practice. Partnership is at the heart of Te Tariti, part of its DNA. That's always been obvious to Māori. So why hasn't it been obvious to Pākehā? Why are we making such a fuss about it now? Why are we so afraid of it? Well, our histories as Māori and Pākehā are very different when it comes to dealing with this treaty. For Māori, it's been all about a long remembering, keeping the story alive and warm on marae in waiata and oratory. For Pākehā, it's been what Patrick Evans called a long forgetting, a gradual amnesia and a rewriting of the story. The most famous painting of the Waitangi signing in 1840 illustrates that vividly. It's an oil by Marcus King done in 1938, and it appears everywhere, including on the cover of the anti-co-governance booklet. Unlike the actual signing, which was a pretty chaotic show with some angry speeches and last minute rearranging, King's painting shows a calm, ordered, polite event in a tent. Even a festive air with bunting decoration and ship's flags, bonneted ladies and helmeted red coat soldiers. Historically, it's a nonsense. If you flew those signal flags on a real ship, you'd run aground. But mythically, it's much loved. As it was on the cover of The Nation Story, the school <coughs> textbook I grew up with. We don't have a Wild West frontier tale to anchor our history, as Americans do though don't be surprised that someone tries to borrow that for the election. But we have a treaty to reenact every year at Waitangi. And until very recently, we have been taking liberties in deciding 
who the good guys and the bad guys are, like the Americans still do with their cowboys and Indians. We're at a stage of history now where our national myth is being rebalanced, realigned, and hopefully restored. And as we do that, the idea of partnership becomes stronger than ever. Now, I've dwelt on the historical and symbolic and cultural roots of co-governance because it lies at the heart of our current divisions and misunderstanding. As Pākehā, we have forgotten how much we have forgotten about partnership and how we dishonour ourselves by our forgetting. Most of the time, we are pretty careful about the rights and obligations of guests and visitors. We know how to wait for invitations, to not outstay our welcome, to return hospitality, to pay our dues. That's all part of being in relationship. Those conventions and protocols go with the territory. Good families know that stuff, especially when you're relating with other good families. It's just manners, after all. But all of that seems to have broken down. After 200 years of living together and alongside each other, you would think we have learned something about how to share this country. Instead, we see panic calls to cancel the partnership, as if you could turn it off like a tap. The opponents of co-governance talk about equal rights rather than partner rights. They talk about equity on the basis of measured need, not of partners sharing and listening to each other. And when, co when partnership is mentioned, it's a fine subscribe to mine variety. Co-governance, just cancel it. I remember what it felt like in the 1980s when one of the favorite posters of the Maori sovereignty movement was Pākehā, go home. It was confronting stuff. Where would I go? My great-great-grandfather's boat fare in 1863 wasn't a return ticket. Equally confronting is the call to subject the treaty to a referendum or to switch off Maorification, to rename our towns with Victorian English generals and gentry, to shut down public talk in Te Reo. Imagine, just imagine, living in an all-white Aotearoa. No brown faces on sports fields or music stages or TV screens. No koru on Air New Zealand tales. No use of Kiwi birds to say who we are. No punamu around our necks. And all the hundreds of co-governance agreements already in place, not only in Newton School, would have to be cancelled. So what would Maori do then? Stay out of sight? Sit in a corner and be quiet, just like the old days? In 1876, the missionary Thomas Grace asked a Maori priest why he didn't attend the synod where only English was spoken. What's the use of going to stand there like a post, said the priest. Another tactic is to avoid taking the, ser the treaty seriously at all and to argue that actually we're all one people, really, as Governor Hobson's words are mistranslated to say. Our history is full of variations on that theme. Maori are dying out. Maori are the same as us deep down. 
Māori aren't proper Māori anymore. How Māori are you anyway? The official government policy up till 50 years ago was assimilation. Wait long enough and Māori will be absorbed into the woodwork and look like us. Could anyone seriously say that anymore? I'm not sure that the anti-co-governance advocates really mean what they say. The message I mostly hear is that a little bit of co-governance would be okay, but please, only locally and not too quickly and on terms that we can control. Turn the co into slow and when it costs me, I'll say no. Inherent in the opposition to co-governance is a different myth and an alternative story to the treaty. It's a myth of absolute equality where everyone has the same rights, the same power to cast a single vote, the same right to enjoy the same freedom. It's a wonderful myth from far away and long ago looking to the never-never future where dreams are made in places like the kingdom called Camelot, where we don't live but would like to visit on screen. Though maybe not, because Camelot was ruled by a king at war with his nobles who were forever trying to betray him. The problem with this equality ideal is that it's divorced from equity, the means we need to enjoy this ideal. Some will need more than others to achieve equality depending on their health and wealth and history. The race to equality is always a handicap race. We don't all start from the same mark. The New Zealand story is one of constant rebalancing to give everyone a fair go in the race, of learning to, what, to recognize what's needed so everyone can take part. So we gave the vote to men only who had individual property, and that automatically excluded Māori. Then we al allowed women to vote as well, goodness gracious. We realized Māori weren't getting a fair deal, so we created Māori seats. And now we're getting around to Māori wards. We cr created preferential treatment for learning where Māori weren't well represented. That principle of restoring equity to achieve equality and fairness is what makes democracy work. It's what, it's what makes partnerships credible. Our hospitals put more resources into caring for the very sick than the not so sick. We spend more on policing the most dangerous public spaces than the safer ones. It costs more to look after the most vulnerable and the most at risk. Yes, it's a choice. It's a value judgment. Just like giving bus lanes preference over cars to promote public transport. But the aim of giving preference is always to rebalance until equality is restored. How best to do that has to involve both partners talking to each other, not simply relying on the best intentions of the bigger one. We saw what happened with the COVID vaccine rollouts. Co-governance is part of that equity restoring effort to bring us all closer to the equality we dream of. Like partnership, it's always been part of the story. The word co-governance is relatively new in our vocabulary though. When the Anglican Church began its preparation for co-governance in the early 1980s, it talked about bicultural development instead. Te kaupapa tikanga rua, defined as partnership focused on the goal of reconciliation 
and unity. And the vocabulary has changed over the years. The church leader's statement in 1990 on the sesquicentennial of the treaty didn't talk about co-governance, but it talked about strong and creative partnership involving deep mutual respect. Is that what the leaders were talking about on Tuesday night? What seems to have driven the emergence of co-governance as a new term is the need for strategies to achieve the promises that we have made to each other. And that includes treaty references and law, treaty settlements, turning them from, in, from words into dollars and hectares, co-managing natural resources, institutions like schools and churches and museums, managing what we hold in common as Māori and Pākehā treaty partners has become an ever, ever bigger task in the last 50 years. Before that, Pākehā mostly believed they could do that on behalf of everyone else, a bit like how men believe they could do that for women too. The most surprising thing about co-governance is how ordinary it is. On the scale of steps toward fully honouring Te Tariti, it's about as modest a step as you could take. It's not about ownership of assets or sovereignty. It's often happening more at a local than a national level. It happens case by case, place by place. But that doesn't mean it can't apply on a larger national scale. The principle is the same. And for some Maori leaders, co-governance is not nearly enough. Chief Executive of Ngāti Toa, Helmut Modlik, says it's a government rather than a Maori idea. It's a creature of bureaucracy, a reprise of racist attitudes and rhetoric. It's ironic that Pākehā opposition is so fierce to a policy that is the mildest and least radical of options for partnership. The bottom line for living in this land under Te Tariti is to respect that partnership. It's clear in the Māori text, it's equally clear in the English. Ned Fletcher's groundbreaking work on the English text shows that the two versions can be reconciled and their intentions can be agreed. Namely, in the words of the preamble to the treaty, it is there to protect the just rights and property of the chiefs and tribes and to secure the enjoyment of peace and good order. And that can mean anything from full constitutional reform of parliament through to co-governance. Faced with all those bolder options, why are we so afraid of co-governance? And modest though it is, we should be glad it works so well because it's pragmatic especially when it comes to managing natural resources like lakes and rivers. In Chris Finlayson's words, it makes sense to use the experience and wisdom who have lived in these places for hundreds of years. Co-governance is about doing that in a spirit of collaboration. Decision-making by consensus, it works. We heard how well it works at Newton School. Western Springs down the road would tell you the same story. So would half a hundred places everywhere from the Waikato River to our National Museum. And best of all, it's the right thing to do. It's the honourable thing to do. Co-governance respects the mana of the partners by fulfilling their obligations to each other, legally, historically, spiritually, and most important, in human terms. 
because it makes room for different indigenous voices to be heard, so it's culturally effective. Co-governing might take longer, but it takes us further in the long run. And when it comes to managing our natural resources, it's the long run that we need like never before. There's a deeper accounting that's going on too when we co-govern. We start, we just begin to redress the legacy of hurt and injustice that scars our history in Aotearoa. We start to right the old wrongs, to acknowledge the futility of the old ways when we ignored each other and when we acted as though we were the only show in town. Where will it take us if we follow co-governing strategies? Well, it could sharpen the debate around the ownership of resources, of land, of place names. It might lead us into conversations about constitutional reform that we've tried to have but failed so far. When Sir Paul Reeves chaired a national conference on rebuilding our constitution, he wrote in the report, the main achievement was to displease equal numbers of people on both sides of the argument. <laughs> but we weren't talking about co-governance back then. We are now, and it might make all the difference. If enough of us had first-hand experience of co-governing our local school or church or council, our local beach or river or park or playground, if we learnt to begin those gatherings with karakia and a greeting or two in Te Reo, the future might not look as scary as it does. And what's more, a few new paintings of the signing of the treaty might start to emerge. Paintings that show it to be the boisterous occasion that it was. Paintings that imagine what a visionary event it was for our future in ways that those who signed it could never have predicted. Paintings that could hang on the walls of Maori and Pākehā homes alike, depicting an event that Maori could be able to trust again, as they once did, and that Pākehā could see as giving them a place to stand, proudly, not fearfully, to be able to call this place home as Tangata Tariti. Thank you very much. John, and thank you very much for your address. We're now going to move to um, the more sort of interactive part of the evening where people have an opportunity to ask questions. Um, <clears throat> certainly thought-provoking address that has brought up a lot of, a lot of issues for people, um, and I'm sure there will be lots of questions out there. Um, I'll start off with a slightly light-hearted one. Uh, you had an image there of a bus and Pākehā having to give up perhaps the front seat and move further back, um, which is quite a, a, quite a nice image. Um, I like that. I like that. Um, I wonder what the Kuiya's response to that image was, but my big question was, more importantly, who's driving the bus? Um, <clears throat> You don't have to answer either of those questions, John, but I'll give you some thinking time while I get some microphones sorted. So uh, Simon is going to, oh, Simon's got one over there, um, and I think I'll get one from down here. So if you have a question, uh, if you just put your hand up, 
and we'll come and give you a microphone and again for those people on Zoom if you could speak into the microphone very clearly that would be helpful and then uh, Simon and myself might take the microphone back and just repeat the question so John can hear it um, and we'll just, we'll just carry on that way. So hands people if you have a question and we will come to you. The courier didn't answer. Um, <laughs> And as for who drives the bus, um, I think we'd have to work out a way of taking shifts um, because all drivers need a rest um, and all drivers drive in their distinctive way. Paul Reeves used to tell the story of, of a tour company taking American tourists around Northland and the bus driver was Maori. And one of the American tourists said, after three or four days of visiting old battle sites, how come every time you tell one of these stories, the Maori always win? <laughs> and the bus driver thought for a moment and said, so long as I'm driving this bus, they're always going to win. <laughs> Really, really brilliant talk, but there's lots of thoughts that surge around my mind when I look at the changing population that we're getting, and I look at things like partnership. Sorry, partnership. We're knocking nearly 50% of our marriages, which are supposed to be partnerships, falling apart because we don't have a strategy for consolidating a partnership in an agreeable way. If your cultures are very different, he comes from this side of the fence, you come from that. It's very difficult to find harmony. So that's part of what disturbed me listening to you. How do we find harmony? Is there a Maori word for forgiveness? Where we can be forgiven what happened in the past. Totally forgiven, like the church decrees. Forgiveness is part of our culture, isn't it? Is the Maori got a concept of forgiveness for the wrongs of the past for us? So John, would you like that question Repeated or are you, it for me. you want me? You want me to summarise it? Okay. <clears throat> um, I, th I think the the idea is that that partnership is a difficult thing to or relationships of partnership are difficult things to manage, um, and when two parties in a partnership appear to be quite different, um, how do how do we sort of find common ground, particularly when perhaps one party has wronged another party? Um, how do we move forward from that? Would, would that yes, and, and, and for this concept of forgiveness, I guess, which is obviously part of that moving that relationship forward. Yeah, I think, I think, the, I think the, the issue about forgiveness is that um, it, it, it's a question of who, who initiates the, the forgiving. Um, you know the 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 parable of um, of the of turning the other cheek uh, is a parable about initiative, about who controls the exchange, the one who who needs to be forgiven, or the one who is causing the grievance. Um, and the problem about forgiveness in the context of partnership is like the problem of forgiveness in the context of a marriage. Uh, and forgiveness is not something that the, the stronger partner can insist on, uh, let alone the aggressor can insist on. Uh, it's, it's a dynamic that depends on the, on the grace of the one who has been hurt. And that's, the, that's what makes this space so difficult for us because we, we, can, we can embody it in terms of that person gave offence to me in an individual exchange. 
but as, as Pākehā and Māori were talking about it in the context of a collective experience of living together for these 200 years and having to carry the weight of that uh, and uh, some countries have attempted this issue of forgiveness recognizing it's a collective thing that frames any individual action they've responded to that by bodies like the Truth and Reconciliation Commission where the whole country was invited to tell the stories to each other together and it was a traumatic experience for those who took part um, and uh, there are some white South Africans who still to this day don't accept the learnings of that, of that, of that Truth and Reconciliation Commission but there are many others whose lives white and black South Africans have been changed as a result of hearing those stories told out loud to each other. Um, but there's no, there's no quick fix on this and you know as Anglicans we, we are incredibly conscious of the report from the commission yesterday on Dilworth School. And the, and the trauma that that involves not only those who took part, but everyone who has been associated with that school and the church that supported that school. And so the dynamic of forgiveness in terms of the Dilworth story is very much in the hands of the victims. And we are going to have to be patient to let that play out and to hear what will be needed, not from those who have been in this position of strength, but for those who have been in the position of weakness. We're gonna to have to wait for that dynamic to work itself out to see what our way ahead is. Some people hoped that the Waitangi Tribunal could have been for us um, something like a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Uh, that has yet to happen and there is yet to find, we have yet to find a body that would do that kind of storytelling and listening. Um, but those bigger narratives are going to frame what you and I need to do when we seek forgiveness from each other. It's, it's always, it's always uh, an exercise that's framed by a history um, and I don't think that's much of an answer, but it's the best I can do. Thank you very much, John. You've given me and I'm sure all of us a great deal to think about. Um, I'm very interested in our history, my own family history, um, which goes back to pre-signing of the treaty. Um, and, it's, and it's been interesting to see how members of my family have been entwined with all the different events in New Zealand history since then. But there are large numbers of people coming in and having recently arrived who do not share any of that history, who come from quite different cultures. And I don't know whether it's even correct to call them Pākehā. I know some groups, like Methodists, use the term Tauiwi. Um, so how do you see them as kind of fitting into the partnership vision? The question is how uh, how do you put in the the people who have come here and make this place home and who don't come from uh, that European, mostly British background that was so defining of Pākehā culture, um, people who have come from a Indian or Asian or Chinese background and who now call themselves 
New Zealanders. And uh, some of them are happy to be hyphenated Pākehās. Um, I have a, a friend I talk about in, in, in my book who's a well-known Dunedin artist whose background is Māori and Chinese and is happy to call himself uh, Pākehā Chinese. Um, but not everyone's happy to do that. And I think that the only way ahead for this one is to, to claim the, the term tangata tariti. Because regardless of what cultural background you come from, to be here, to live in this land, to claim the right to call it home, involves honouring the partnership. You've got to find your place in that partnership. And that partnership is always going to allow you to call yourself tangata tariti if you honour that partnership. So I think that's the way ahead. I think the, the term Pākehā is incredibly problematic. Uh, one recent poll said that only 10% of non-Māori, to use our leader's terms, um, are, are happy to use that term. I mean, most people want to call themselves Kiwi. But of course, that begs the question if you don't include the treaty. So I don't think you can be a Kiwi without the treaty. And the way to, do, to ensure that is to use the language of Tangata Tariti. I think, I think that's the way to do it. And, and there's, a, there's other variations. There's, um, some people talk about themselves as Nati Chinese and Nati Indian. But, but uh, for me, um, the best framework I can think of is to use that language of Tangata Tariti, the people of the treaty. Kia ora, uh, Bishop. Um, thank you for your wonderful presentation. It's really uh, insightful. Um, I have actually been talking to a gentleman um, in my role, and um, he's very concerned about co-governance and sharing, but his uh, gripe with it is the sharing of power. And often I think people, for example, with a lot of wealth, they hate the wealth tax. People with a lot of power hate you know, their power being taken away. Um, can you speak to that a little bit? This is, the, this is about the image of who's sitting in the front seat of the bus, isn't it? Um, and um, I mean, the uncomfortable truth is that if we are going to get to a point where co-governance is the is the default strategy uh, if we are going to even consider constitutional reform uh, where there is a Maori voice at the heart of the, the parliamentary process, structurally, not just as a lobby or a caucus, um, then Pākehā will be less powerful. And we will, we will have to get our head around that. But, you know, uh, one, one Māori commentator in responding to this, this fear said, um, at the end of the day, it comes down to a question of whether you trust Māori to treat you better than we have treated you for the last 200 years. Um, it, it comes down to that simple question of, of trust. And trust happens when people are in relationship, when they're in relationship in the classroom, on the sports field, on the, on the concert stage, in the, in the bicultural families that make up 
half of our families in, in this country. To the, w w when we get to the point where it is no longer odd to think of having a Maori partner, a Maori friend, a Maori workmate, when Maori faces are not strange faces but familiar faces, then I think the inevitable shift of power, and it will be a shift of power, a sharing of power, I think that will be less, less, less fearful and less threatening. Um, Well, Simon, I feel like my half has done all the heavy lifting thus far. Could you do some encouraging over your side of the church, please? Thank you for stepping Look, I think we can thrash around with our Pākehā legalistic minds forever saying, what did they mean by kawanatanga and what did they really mean by tino rangatira tanga? But that's not actually going to get us very far. I stand back and I think actually it's a relational approach that we need to take to understand it. And the Māori approach was let's all flourish together. And the Pākehā approach was well actually let's be quite individualistic and grab what we can. Now if we're going to find a harmonious, constructive and fair way forward, how do we help Pākehā to understand the sea in which they're swimming, which is a white Western European worldview, and open up to listen and learn about another perspective. You can see I'm in an interracial marriage, so I've been through this a little bit. You see, I think the biggest problem is that uh, there, there, there's a whole generation of Pākehā New Zealanders, non-Māori, who, who have never had a Māori friend, never played in sports teams with, with Māori, never had any close contact with Māori. I think the, the kind of the silo separation of, of of New Zealanders from each other by wealth and address and postcode uh, just makes that just makes that that distance threatening because it's it's unfamiliar territory it's it's we are all afraid of things we don't know and we're afraid of people we don't know and uh, for those people who have been living in isolation in disconnection from the Maori Renaissance, which has happened over the last 40, 50 years, it is, it is really scary stuff. Uh, and that pamphlet of Julian Batchelor just, for me, summarizes it. So uh, I, I, was, I was kind of grateful to Mr. Batchelor for, for the, the kind of innocent, almost naive way in which he, he described this, this, this surprise, for goodness sake, what's going on, you know? And um, that's why I use that Auden poem, because, because it, the poem is about the shock of dislocation. And that, I think, is at the heart of what we are going through at the moment in all this fear and loathing about co-governance. At the heart of it, it's a lack of, under, lack of familiarity. It's a, it, it's a lack of seeing how, how actually we've had, we've had a couple of hundred years of learning to live alongside each other, and generations before us did it better than we do. So for me, it starts with contact, familiarity, uh, sharing humor, sharing classroom, sharing church place, sharing workplace. When, 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 those con when those connections happen, then I think the fear dissolves. So for me, it's, it's really simple. It's about the, the kind of ghettoization, the silo creation of what's happening 
in the gap between, the growing gap between wealth and poverty in this country. Uh, kia ora, Bishop. Um, my question for you is, you spoke a bit about Te Pohiri and the constitution of the Anglican Church uh, and the process of seeking a co-governance approach as an Anglican Church, but I think the lived experience of Te Pohiri has been uh, not very equitable uh, between our three tikanga structure. My question is, what is your dream for the future of the church that is truly co-governance-led and truly equitable? Well, I can say these things as a, as a retired bishop, which would get me <laughs> into trouble if I was still, if I was still at work. Um, but uh, I, think, I think the constitution that we passed in 1992 was a visionary constitution, and um, it gave us the, the framework that would let us what, what the Constitution called explore the common ground. We didn't set up three tikanga in order to have separate distance. We set it up in order to together be able to find common ground. And for the first five years, we actually legislated for things we called common life hui, which enabled different parts of the church to come together and talk about the issues and plan together plan co-governance structures together. Now sadly, this is where the Anglicans have, have not done well. Those common life hui disappeared. And increasingly, for many Anglicans, tikanga by tikanga have less contact, less familiarity now than they did before the Constitution was passed. So um, we, have, we have not done well at following up on the structure that we had in place, which would have, could have, and still could, lead us to common ground. Now, uh, the, 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 the people who would disagree with me say, well, actually, we've only had this constitution since 1992, and we've been talking about a system that we screwed up back in 1857 when we passed a constitution that gave Māori no voice. That meant that Māori priests felt they were standing like posts when they went to a general synod. So historically, yes, we, it's, it's, it's still recent times, but we had better get our act together because the Three Tiganga Church is, is, is designed to build unity and reconciliation and common ground. And that only happens when we sit down together, when we break bread together, when we, when we laugh together and sing together and pray together. Uh, at the level of General Synod, the Constitution has been a wonderful thing. Uh, we, we, we don't have the divisions like we used to. You know, prior to 1990, you spent your time, like you do in Parliament, going through the door marked A's and the door marked no's, and, you know, 57 to 46, making decisions like that. The, the co-governing constitution forced us to find a way of reaching consensus. It was painful, it took a long time, it was messy, but it made decisions that, that worked. What we haven't done is, is, is created those social and cultural occasions that bring people together. Uh, I wonder if I can just um, piggyback off of the previous question. Um, just as a bit of background, I spent 15 years in South Africa, and so have a bit of familiarity with the Truth and Reconciliation Committee. Sadly, the younger generation really feel like Tutu sold out. Um, so there's a real bitterness 
towards cheap forgiveness. And I guess my question piggybacks off of yours. Uh, what do we need to do about restitution? Well, I would think that um, the Waitangi Tribunal is, uh, is, is, is addressing that issue. Um, and yes, it's inadequate, and yes, it's a long way to go, and uh, there are people in this room who know a whole lot more about it than I do. Perhaps, D David, you might like to say something about that. <laughs> uh, if I, if I could put it back to you, though, John, uh, so that um, um, truth and reconciliation only works if, um, if, if we... Uh, have a chance to, to hear each other. And um, I'm now on the Waitangi Tribunal, so I can't give a comment on what the outcome might be because I've got to listen to what people say to me. But, um, and there's one or two judges in the room who know what the problem is. But um, uh, Waitangi Tribunal hearings have been open to anyone that wants to attend them for the whole time that the uh, tri tribunal has worked. Um, sadly, almost only Māori attend to hear the histories. There's been a lot of truth and reconciliation talk in Waitanga Tribunal hearings, and some, some of it filters through into the reports, although they're lengthy and, you know, go on a bit. Um, uh, the treaty settlements, though, they're the political compromise to get through to the end of the day and give about a 4% quantum redress and so on. So, um, so I think I think I agree with what you were saying about process. It's the process of meeting. And, if, and, if, and there's, a lot, there's a lot of tribunal hearings going on that people can come to. If more people came to them, took that story back to their church or their whatever, um, then, then, then it would be a, a whole community effort rather than just leaving it to the lawyers and, uh, and the people writing reports. But that, that's not truth and reconciliation. Uh, I, I, I don't want to um, comment on Desmond Tutu uh, because I don't have enough background on modern South Africa to be able to comment on that. I think uh, we're coming to the end of uh, our questions, but there was an earlier question asking about whether Māori had a concept of, of forgiveness or what that perhaps looked like in Tao Māori. And uh, that reminded me of um, <clears throat> an anecdote that Hannah and Margie shared last week when, you know, in their co-governance relationship, like all relationships, hiccups happen. So forgiveness is required for that restoration of relationship and to move forward. And I wondered whether Margie and Hannah might have a comment to make about that concept of forgiveness in Te Māori just as a way of wrapping this up. Uh, kia ora tātou, um, is it okay if I go? Okay, move forward. That's all the electricity coming off me. <laughs> I actually did want to come over here um, to stand before the lovely lady who had that question. So I am Margie, I am Māori, and I am of Ngāti Whātua descent. Um, I was one of the presenters last week alongside Hana, and I'm actually going to invite Hana up. Uh, so we can see what co-governance looks like in living form. I think there was a phrase for that, wasn't Voluntold. 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 Yeah, this, this is our um, co-governance policy. Um, the term is aroha. Uh, it has a lot of meanings behind it. It's commonly known as love. Um, and my friend here said, but what about trust? It's all fundamentally based on aroha. When I spoke last week, I spoke about um, if my dad was still alive today, he'd be 88. And I was raised with my grandmother who'd be around 110, 12 now, until I was in my 20s. So they lived the period of the Tohungism Act and has been mentioned, uh, the Ratana faith, the church, um, that helped shelter them in that time because they were first, they were native speakers. And my dad was of that gen who went to a native school and was punished if, he's, if he did things and so forth. So it chokes us up. But I stand here today quite willing and come with a very open heart to make this space work 
and see how we coexist for the benefit of our kids at our school and my children. And actually, the foundation of our co-governance partnership is actually based on whanaungatanga, which is relationships. So for me, it's not about, and I think many of the 25 years of people that, that stood Newton, it's not been about holding space for us. It's been around how we share our culture and our heritage. And in doing so, we've been able to enrich in our school and the experience for our children. In doing so, there are times where Māori worldview can help us. Um, and more so, there are times when non-Māori worldview can help us. And we've had a recent event where we're dealing with a dispute. And in a Māori worldview, we'll, we'll use a process called hohoterongo, which is um, a value that's often practiced with, with leaders who, who literally stand up, everyone has their say, they're uninterrupted, no filter, but it's our way of releasing. We all have our say, then we go loop around. The other option in front of us in this situation was mediation. So we took up the mediation path, and then we realised midway through it, um, the, the person that this was occurring with was also a non-Māori, that they had brought in some Māori words into this mediation process. And right there, with my understanding of world, world, Māori worldview, um, I'm a fluent speaker, um, I was able to make the distinction, identify it very clearly around what the two pathways were, and we found some form of reconciliation. There were parts that we could see would be better this route, and parts we could see were better that route. What I think our school does well is because we have the best of both worlds, and we've given it equally. Um, look, see, she's, she's, she's finishing my sentences without even saying anything. And, and this, is, this is what we do. Um, interestingly enough, what tripped the cause for us to consider needing to put someone up in our, or form this co-governance, was because although the school had supported a Māori, Māori language speaking unit in the school, and it was operating for some years, there came the annual event where the Māori unit in the school wanted to do a pōhiri, a formal welcome in Māori, for everyone that was coming on. Interestingly enough, the teacher or the principal at the time was Māori, but had to decline it because it wasn't welcomed from the school at the time. And this is what tripped us to want to sit in spaces to help share and understand and help our, help our colleagues in that area and the parents and the board to better understand. Now we're, um, we have just formalised um, our co-governance model um, in legislation after 25 years in the making. Uh, the structure um, celebrates your standard one principal, one teacher, this wasn't disputed, um, four parents from our mainstream side and four parents from our Māori medium side and also um, a seat dedicated towards Ngāti Whātua in recognition of their mana whenua. Um, to my understanding, we're one of the first, I'm biased and I'll say we're the first, to formulate a model like that. But what we have actually done is provided our children at that school with the best of both worlds as we travel forward. So that's my thoughts. I don't really think I can say much after that. Um, all I can say is that um, we spoke last week about a time when our board, very ne this whole co-governance model, very nearly did fall apart. And I was nervous coming to the table in front of our Te Whao, our, our Māori board, um, and it wasn't, a, forgiveness wasn't talked about, but the openness of heart, the openness of spirit and the willingness to rebuild and creating a space where there's the trust and the relationships are there that naturally forgiveness is sort of almost assumed because you're working towards a, a greater good and building something better. Um, it's been incredibly humbling and is, yeah, it's getting shivers down my spine even thinking about it, like it really is. Um, if you create that base, um, forgiveness just naturally flows.
Sorry about that. Um, last week I, I did comment that often when people give... Last week um, I said um, that often when people are saying thank you... Uh, Is this working? Last week, um, when I did this, I said that often people who thank a speaker spend longer than the speaker um, and bore the, com bore the congregation or the audience rigid. Um, so I don't intend to do that because I think it would do a great disservice to what was an absolutely wonderful, inspiring and thoughtful address. Um, all I want to say is that my first real experience of co-governance was about 25 years ago when I attended a kura kaupapa um, hui at Matauri Bay. And it was absolutely pelting down with rain. And there were a group of kids, girls and boys, Māori Pākehā, um, all playing rugby in the mud. Um, and, you know, it was just absolutely teeming. And they had a wonderful time. And I saw disputes break out. Actually, I snuck outside at the time to have a cigarette. I shouldn't have done that. But anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll go past that. Anyway, um, these kids were, uh, ended up in fights and disputes. And they interchanged between speaking English and te reo. Both the Māori and the Pākehā kids um, just changed back and forward as they were sort of verbally duking it out to, to work out whose pass it was and whose penalty it was and so forth. And I remember calling my wife later that night and thinking, what a wonderful vision that was, actually, for the future. These little kids, both speaking um, both languages, all speaking both languages, and actually resolving issues um, in that way. And I often wonder what happened to them. I hope they've done well. Um, Bishop John, it was a wonderful address. We all, I'm sure, thank you for it. And I just hope that the messages that you gave tonight actually filter through some of the thicker heads um, that we have in our community and society. Thank you. So I just want to to uh, talk that for John, and uh, also thank you, too many Johns, Bishop John. Thank you for your address. Um, <clears throat> so as I opened with Karakia, I hold the Maori for this meeting, so I'm also going to close with Karakia. Fakaohoho te Wairua, fakaohoho te Mana, fakaohoho te Hinengaro, fakaohoho te Tinana, fakaohoho te Maori, haumi e hui e taiki e. So kia ora koutou everybody, there, that ends the formal proceedings for tonight. As I said uh, at the beginning, there is a cup of tea or coffee and some refreshments at the back of the church. You are very welcome to stay, <coughs> excuse me, stay and have a little bit more of a relaxed conversation with people and perhaps even uh, Bishop John will gracefully make himself available if you want to bend his ear. Um, otherwise, we just wish you all a safe journey home and a good night. Thank you. Thank you.